This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 63, for broadcast on the 10th of August, 2018. Coming up on Space Time. No firewalls around black holes. The first successful test of general relativity near a supermassive black hole. And thousands watch in awe as a meteor streaks across the east coast of Australia. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Scientists sceptical about a so-called black hole firewall hypothesis say their calculations have found a flaw in the firewall argument. Their findings, reported in the Journal of High Energy Physics, instead suggest that black holes, in reality, are little more than ever-growing balls of string energy. Black holes are singularities, points of infinite density in zero volume. They're created through the collapse or mergers of massive stars and at the centres of most, if not all, galaxies. Matter passing too close to a black hole can get caught up in its gravitational well. As material falls into a black hole, it forms or joins an accretion disk where it collides and is crushed, ripped, stretched and torn apart, releasing huge amounts of energy. Most of this debris then passes a point of no return called an event horizon, beyond which the escape velocity exceeds the speed of light. And since nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, nothing, not even light, can escape a black hole once it crosses the event horizon. Once beyond the event horizon, matter is spaghettified as it falls forever towards the singularity, a place where the laws of physics, as science understands them, breaks down. Some physicists have hypothesized that black holes are surrounded by a sort of firewall that would incinerate anything getting sucked into its powerful gravitational pull. However, Professor Samir Matur from Ohio State University has been a strong opponent of this idea for years. Matur's latest calculations have examined what would happen if an electron fell into a typical stellar mass black hole with, say, the mass of our Sun. He claims the probability of an electron hitting a photon from the black hole's radiation and burning up is virtually negligible, dropping even further if one considers much larger black holes. The new study builds on previous work by Matur and colleagues back in 2004. It hypothesised that black holes are really like giant, messy balls of yarn, fuzzballs that gather more and more mass as new objects get sucked in. Matur says that hypothesis resolved the famous black hole information paradox, outlined by Stephen Hawking in 1975. See, Hawking's research had concluded that particles entering a black hole can never leave. But that ran counter to the laws of quantum mechanics claiming that information can never be destroyed, creating the paradox. Hawking eventually came up with the idea of Hawking radiation, allowing black holes to evaporate back into the universe, returning information to the universe through the creation of virtual quantum particle pairs right on the event horizon. The firewall argument emerged in 2012 when four physicists from the University of California, Santa Barbara, argued that any object like a fuzzball would have to be surrounded by a ring of fire that would burn any object before it could reach the fuzzball surface. Matur says he's found a flaw in the firewall argument. Black holes are invisible, but scientists can establish their mass by observing how they affect the space around them. Matur and colleagues use string theory. The idea is... Everything's made up of atoms, but atoms themselves are made up of smaller particles called the nucleus, which consists of protons and neutrons, surrounded by a halo of electrons. And the protons and neutrons themselves are made up of even smaller particles, elemental particles, called quarks. One of the key tenets of string theory is that these subatomic particles are themselves made up of even smaller components, consisting of string-like tubes of energy vibrating at different frequencies, depending on whether it's a photon, an electron, a quark, or whatever. The belief is rooted in the marriage of quantum mechanics, which explains the universe at the subatomic level, and Albert Einstein's relativity theory, which explains the universe on cosmic scales. Being a firewall sceptic, Matur says the question is, where does the black hole grab you? He thinks that as something approaches the event horizon, the fuzzball surface grows to meet it before it has a chance to reach the hottest part of the radiation. Matur says this is the crucial finding of his work, which he believes invalidates the firewall argument. 
He says the firewall argument simply seems to be a quick way to prove that something falling through the event horizon burns up. But he insists his calculations show there can't be any such sort of quick argument. And what really happens can only be decided by detailed calculations in string theory. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. There's an old saying in physics, it never pays to bet against Albert Einstein. And that's been proven right yet again, with observations of stars orbiting the supermassive black hole at the centre of the Milky Way galaxy, confirming Professor Einstein's general theory of relativity. Observations made with the European Southern Observatory's very large telescope, the VLT in Chile, have for the first time revealed the effects predicted by Dr. Einstein's general relativity on the motion of a star passing through the extreme gravitational field generated by a supermassive black hole. The new findings are the culmination of a 26-year-long study. Obscured by thick clouds of absorbing gas and dust, the closest supermassive black hole to Earth, known as Sagittarius A star, lies some 26,000 light-years away at the centre of our Milky Way galaxy. This gravitational monster, which has a mass of 4.3 million times that of the Sun, is surrounded by a group of stars orbiting around it at high speed. This extreme environment provides the strongest gravitational field in our galaxy, and it makes it the perfect place to explore gravitational physics, especially for a test of Professor Einstein's general theory of relativity. The new infrared observations using the VLT have allowed astronomers to follow one of these stars, known as S2, as it passed very close to the black hole in May 2018. S2 orbits the black hole every 16 years in a highly eccentric orbit. At its closest point, the star is less than 20 billion kilometres, or 120 astronomical units, from the black hole, and moving at a speed in excess of 25 million kilometres an hour. That's some 8,000 kilometres per second, or 2.7% the speed of light. An astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, about 150 million kilometres, or 8.3 light minutes. 120 astronomical units is about four times the distance from the Sun to Neptune. This distance corresponds to about 1,500 times the Schwarzschild radius of the black hole itself. A Schwarzschild radius usually refers to the radius of the event horizon surrounding a non-rotating black hole. However, in point of fact, it actually refers to the physical radius any object of a given mass would have if it were a black hole with its mass scrunched down to less than that radius. So, the Sun has a Schwarzschild radius of about 3 kilometres, and the Earth has one of just 9 millimetres. The authors compared their position and velocity measurements using the VLT with previous observations of S2 using other instruments with the predictions of Newtonian gravity, general relativity and other theories of gravity. The new results were shown to be inconsistent with Sir Isaac Newton's predictions, but in excellent agreement with the predictions of general relativity. The study's lead author, Reinhard Genzel, from the Max Planck Institute in Germany, says while it's the second time his team were able to observe the passage of S2 around the black hole at the galactic centre, it's the first time they were able to study it in such unprecedented resolution thanks to the VLT, providing them with a unique opportunity to observe general relativistic effects. The new measurements clearly reveal an effect called gravitational redshift. Light from the star is stretched to longer wavelengths by the very strong gravitational field of the black hole. And the change in the wavelength of light from S2 agrees precisely with that predicted by Einstein's theory of general relativity. It's the first time that this deviation from the predictions of the simpler Newtonian theory of gravity have been observed in the motions of a star around a supermassive black hole. The authors use the VLT's Sinfoni instrument to measure the velocity of S2 towards and away from the Earth, and the gravity instrument in the VLT's interferometer to make extraordinarily precise measurements of the changing position of S2 in order to define the shape of its orbit. During the close passage, Genzel and colleagues were able to detect the faint glow around the black hole, allowing them to precisely follow the star in its orbit, ultimately leading to the detection of the gravitational redshift in the spectrum of S2. Redshift refers to how far elemental lines in a spectrum are shifted away from you due to the object receding from your point of view. So, over 100 years after he published his paper setting out the equations of general relativity, Einstein has been proven right once more, in a much more extreme laboratory than he could have ever possibly hoped to use. 
To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with Dr Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science. Confirming relativity. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a cataclysmic story of epic proportions. Yep, this is a story I've been following well, actually, for a lot, a, a long, a large proportion of the time that it's been running, this is a study that's been going for 26 years. I only caught up with it a decade or so ago, so I'm a relative newcomer to to the uh, the problem. But it's work that's led by a German scientist whose name is Reinhard Gentzel, and Reinhard works for the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in Garching in Germany, which is um, the actually a suburb of Munich. So what's he? Has and his team have been doing for the last 26 years is observing a group of stars which are in orbit around the supermassive black hole at the middle of our galaxy. So it's pretty extreme work that he's doing. Now, one of the issues that confronts you immediately when you start tackling work like this is that in optical telescopes, telescopes that use visible light, those stars are invisible because the direction to the center of our galaxy is blocked by clouds of dust. There's dust clouds in the spiral arms that are between ourselves and the galaxy. And that's why when we look at the night sky, the center of our galaxy is in the constellation of Sagittarius, which passes overhead from our latitudes here in Australia. And when you look at the Milky Way in that region, it's very wide because you're seeing the kind of bulge of our galaxy, which is the fat bit in the middle. Mm. But the view to the centre itself, even though there are star clouds there, the star clouds of Sagittarius are glorious on a, on a winter's night, you are still finding the view blocked by dust, so you don't see all the way to the galactic centre. This harks back to work I did, actually, and believe this or not, the 1970s. I worked with a scientist at the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh, and we were looking for stars which were sort of circulating around the galactic centre, but no way near as, as close to the middle as the Gentil stars are. So what do they do to penetrate this dust? They use infrared. infrared. Oh, OK, I was thinking radio telescopes because they, they are able to do... The, the, you get past some of these blind spots, and there are massive numbers of blind spots. There, there are, yeah. So radio telescopes would also penetrate the dust, and that's how we know that the black hole is there, actually, because it, it emits radio emission. Stuff swirls into it. But you can't see stars with radio telescopes because they're, they're radio quiet, but you can with infrared telescopes. And so this team has probed the dust clouds with infrared radiation and observed over a long period of time with very high accuracy this group of stars very close to the supermassive black hole. And what they've done over the 26 years is been able to plot the orbits of these stars as they circulate around the black hole. It's quite extraordinary stuff. When you watch a movie of it, it's like these sort of moths fluttering around something that's not there because mm. you can't see the black hole in the infrared. And in particular, they've looked at one star, which is the star that passes closest to the black hole. You would think that that would have a special name. I always think it should be called Proxima Galactica. Oh, or yes. Like. Very good. Yeah. They but should employ you. Yeah, they should. Because name it things. actually is called S2, oh. which is... <laughs> <laughs> to distinguish it from S3, S4. Yep. And, you know, I'm hazarding a guess here, Andrew, but I wonder if the S might stand for star? Well, it could. <laughs> so star number two. Star mm. number two comes within 20 billion kilometres of the black hole itself. And that's pretty close. I mean, re remember in our solar system, Pluto is about 6 billion kilometres from the sun. So 20 billion kilometres is is not much bigger than the, the size of the solar system. It's a very, very close approach. That is tight, isn't it? It's very tight, but that and that's the, the crucial aspect of this story. But because this thing's in orbit, it doesn't get sucked in by the black hole. It just carries on whizzing around it, passing within 20 billion kilometres. I think every 16 years, if, I, if um, my recollection is correct, that it's mm. got a period of rotation of 16 years. So that's fantastic stuff. And these observations are stunning, but uh, they also allow us to test general relativity, the Einstein theory of gravity. Why do we want to test that? Because uh, we test it all the time. And the answer is because we're looking for something to go wrong with it. We're looking for a place where it doesn't work. We're looking for dints in the theory uh, exactly. and reasons to prove Einstein wrong. And um, I don't think we have yet, have we? No, we haven't. Uh, in fact, it's come through every test with flying colours. But why do we want to prove him wrong? Because we want to find 
new physics. You know, we believe that the theory of relativity is not the end of the story. And there are certain things within it that we don't understand, especially when it related to quantum mechanics, which is the other fundamental theory of physics, the one that deals with the very small. General relativity tends to deal with the very large. And the two are kind of more or less incompatible. So there's something wrong somewhere. Mm. And that's why we're always probing these theories to try and find flaws in them that would open up possibilities of there being new physics. And new physics is really interesting because it could include higher dimensions and all of that sort of thing. So that's why people are interested in testing general relativity. How do you do it with a star that passes close to a black hole? Well, the thing is that the, the space around the black hole is very highly distorted by the gravitational attraction of the black hole itself. So you've got this star that's passing through distorted space. It behaves accordingly because of that. And the crucial thing is that if relativity was not working and it was just Newtonian dynamics, the theory would all fall over. The star, you wouldn't understand why the star was behaving like it does in this extreme gravitational field. So the fact that it behaves exactly as relativity predicts by behaving, I'm now talking about the speed it, it reaches as it goes past the black hole yeah. and things of that sort. That, once again, as I said, demonstrates that so far we haven't found any cracks in general relativity, which is in on the one hand annoying, and on the other hand a major triumph for um, for Einstein himself. Yes, indeed, yeah. I, and, uh, and as I keep saying, he was just a man way ahead of his time. I mean, what intellect, what intellect to come up with something that all these years later still cannot be proven wrong. Yeah, that's right. Yes, it's it's really remarkable stuff. Uh, eventually, I'm sure there will be something that will open up that will reveal that yes. That's something we don't understand, and we've got to think of ways of testing it. Wouldn't be dark energy, would it? Well, dark energy is one of the problems that we don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> dark matter we understand better than dark energy. Dark matter is clearly some kind of species of subatomic particle that we haven't found yet. And so that's kind of down to the particle physicists with their colliders and things to get to the bottom of it. But dark energy and energy of space itself, we really don't have much in the way of clues for that. And relativity is probably going to be the road in that leads us to understand that. That's Dr. Fred Watson speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. The east coast of New South Wales has witnessed a spectacular celestial show with a fireball streaking across the evening sky. The meteor was seen as far north as the Queensland Gold Coast, right along the New South Wales coastline, and as far south as Gippsland in eastern Victoria. The meteor was witnessed by thousands of people. Dashcam video showed the bluish-green fireball light up the darkened skies from the east, apparently breaking apart as it travelled. Its apparent brightness suggests that this meteor could have been something between 30 and 70 centimetres wide, and its blue-green tail suggests the meteor had an iron composition. And iron meteors, if they're large enough, can survive atmospheric entry, making it all the way to the ground where they become meteorites. It's unlikely that this meteor was part of the current Perseids meteor shower, which is peaking this weekend. Perseids have a radiant which, from somewhere like Sydney, would be well to the northern horizon, with best viewing occurring between midnight and dawn. This meteor was seen at 6.30 in the evening. Scientists are urging anyone with video of the meteor to upload the file to the Fireballs in the Sky app, That will help astronomers pinpoint its trajectory across the sky and where it may have come down. This latest event follows last week's report of a big green fireball in North Queensland skies, seen by people in areas as far afield as Mackay, Townsville and Cairns. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Virgin Galactic space plane VSS Unity has carried out its third powered test flight. The rocket-powered spacecraft was launched from the runway of the Mojave Spaceport near Los Angeles by its White Knight II mothership, the VMS Eve, climbing to an altitude of 14,000 metres or 46,500 feet. Unity was then released from the White Knight II, igniting its hybrid rocket engine for a 42-second burn, which accelerated the space plane to a speed of Mach 2.47, almost two and a half times the speed of sound. It climbed to an apogee of 52,000 metres, or 170,800 feet. It then returned to the planet's surface, gliding to a smooth runway landing back at the Mojave spaceport just an hour and 15 minutes after it had taken off. 
This flight was designed to gather more details about the environmental conditions inside Unity's cabin. Unity completed its first test flight back in April, four years after Unity's predecessor, the VSS Enterprise, broke apart in midair, killing one of its test pilots. That failure was eventually traced back to the premature unlocking and deployment of the tail boom feathering system during the ascent phase of the flight. See, the feathering system's designed to slow down the spacecraft during its return flight to the Earth. Virgin Galactic's plan is to eventually fly tourists to an altitude of 100 kilometres, the internationally recognised official start of space, where passengers will experience around five minutes of microgravity and spectacular views of the planet below before returning to Earth. Virgin Galactic head Richard Branson says the first space tourists could be flying by the end of the year. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. SpaceX has successfully placed 10 more Iridium Next telecommunications satellites into orbit, just three days after launching its largest ever payload, the Telstar 19 Vantage. While the Telstar was launched from Cape Canaveral, the Iridium 7 mission blasted off from Space Launch Complex 4 at the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Both missions used the new Block 5 version of the Falcon 9 rocket. The Iridium 7 flight was launched in thick fog and in pre-dawn darkness. T minus 15 seconds. Falcon 9 is configured for flight. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Ignition. Lift off the Falcon 9. Vehicle is pushing down range. Nominal. Avionics power and telemetry nominal. Falcon 9, leaving Earth under 1.7 million pounds of thrust. We're throttling the nine Merlin engines right now as we get ready for the period of a maximum dynamic pressure as the vehicle goes supersonic. The vehicle is supersonic. Following its launch, and despite strong crosswinds and extremely rough seas, the Falcon 9 first stage successfully returned to the surface, landing aboard the drone ship, just read the instructions, which was positioned about 235 kilometers downrange, in the North Pacific Ocean. SpaceX was less successful, however, in their attempt to recover the payload fairings as they parachuted back to the surface. The newly deployed satellites are part of an order of 81 Iridium Next satellites designed to replace the original Iridium constellation, which was launched back in the 1990s. Each of the new 860 kilogram spacecraft is based around the Thales Alenia Space Extended Lifetime Bus, known as the Elite Bus 1000 platform, equipped with L band transponders to communicate directly with customers' satellite phones and devices, and with KA band transponders to link directly to ground stations and cross link to other satellites in the constellation. The flight was the penultimate mission for SpaceX's contract with Iridium, with a final launch placing the remaining 10 satellites in orbit expected to take place either in September or October. Its next launch, slated for next week, will deploy Indonesia's Telkom 4 telecommunications satellite. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. Scientists have developed a new type of anti-cancer drugs that put cancer cells into a permanent sleep. The new treatment, reported in the journal Nature, has none of the harmful side effects caused by conventional cancer therapies. The new class of drugs could provide an exciting alternative for people with cancer and has already shown great promise in halting cancer progressions in models of blood and liver cancers as well as in delaying cancer relapse. New research by the Australian National University has found agreements to protect the critically endangered swift parrot in Tasmania have been repeatedly broken, leaving the species at high risk of extinction. Scientists have found that despite legislation, logging has continued in known and protected breeding habitats for the birds. Researchers say a lack of political will by government to enforce the law and prosecute offenders means the plight of the swift parrot has now worsened. The ongoing illegal logging operations directly contravene Forestry Tasmania's claims to maintain the integrity of the parrot's breeding habitats. Scientists estimate the numbers of swift parrots now left in existence to be as low as 1 to 2,000 individual birds. The highly endangered birds need flowering Tasmanian black and blue gums for food, as well as trees over 150 years old to provide suitable hollows for nesting. However, due to policy and management failures, logging of breeding habitats continues to be approved despite expert advice and scientific evidence that demonstrates the cessation of logging of breeding habitats is urgently required. 
The problem's being exasperated by a combination of crooked politicians, corrupt bureaucrats and unscrupulous loggers. The first systematic analysis of marine wilderness around the planet has found that just 13% of the world's oceans can still be classified as wilderness. The remaining wilderness areas are scattered across the globe, with the largest areas found in the Arctic and Antarctic and around remote Pacific islands, while in coastal regions there's virtually no wilderness left at all. The findings, reported in the journal Current Biology, highlights just how much of an impact humans have had on the 70% of the planet's surface which is underwater. A new study has confirmed what most animal lovers already know, namely that dogs show empathy if their owners are feeling sad or in distress and will also try to help rescue them. The findings, reported in the journal Learning and Behaviour, are based on tests of 34 dogs in which the owners either gave distressed cries or just hummed to themselves while sitting behind a closed see-through door. The authors found that dogs hearing distress calls were far more likely to open the door compared to dogs who just heard someone humming. And if their owner was crying, the door would open much faster. Interestingly, based on their physiological and behavioural responses, the dogs who opened the doors were in fact much less stressed than what they were during baseline measurements, indicating that they would suppress their own distress so they could jump into action quicker. The study therefore provides clear evidence that dogs not only feel empathy towards their owners, but in some cases also act on this empathy. This happens especially when they are able to suppress their own feelings of distress and instead can focus on the human they are trying to help. No wonder dogs are considered man's best friend. Skepticon 2018 will be held in Sydney, Australia on the 13th and 14th of October. Aran Segev, President of Australian Skeptics, is a regular contributor to the space-time program. And he joins us now to provide a skeptics guide to Skepticon 2018. Skepticism is about evaluating the evidence for things and, and forming opinions based on the available evidence. Uh, most of the time, the evidence would be scientific, but it doesn't have to be. There are other ways of assessing evidence. So Australian skeptics have a goal of encouraging society at large to be more rational and more evidence-based. And that means that we are generally, as a, as a group, as a, as a movement, attracted to science, attracted to the kind of things that scientists are attracted to. What do skeptics talk about when they get together? Tell me about this conference. Oh, well, we just sit around doubting things, of course. <laughs> um, so uh, we tend to have buried a set of interests. Different people will be interested in different things. And our conventions reflect that. But we also have a varied a set of speakers from journalists such as uh, Carrie Poppy. She's an American journalist who researches uh, the paranormal very often. She has a podcast with her uh, friend Ross Bolcher. Uh, it's called Oh No, Ross and Carrie. And they go and investigate for themselves various things like they've actually uh, joined the activities of Scientology in order to have an inside look. Uh, but they look at all kinds of various forms of paranormal and pseudoscientific activities and then they report on them. As they say, we do it so you don't have to. We have Dr. Pamela Gay, who is an astronomer and podcaster. I'm sure many of your listeners would know about her. She is, amongst other things, the part of the team that does Astronomy Cast, together with Fraser Kane from Universe Today, an educational podcast about astronomy that's been running for more than 10 years now. So she will uh, come and speak to us. We have uh, Yvette Duntremont, dubbed the Psy Babe. The Psy Babe, is she sort of the, the skeptics version of the food babe? Well, yeah, that's how she, st she started by debunking the uh, atrociously inaccurate claims of the food babe and it became more of a just a general promotion of science and debunking kind of activity and that's what she does now for those people who don't know the food babe her famous line is i'm in an aircraft and there's only 20 percent oxygen here exactly she was very worried about the 80 percent nitrogen that the <laughs> that those evil big, um, big airline <laughs> yeah, yeah put into the planes uh, so um yeah so obviously there's a lot of fodder there for somebody like yvette but yvette does a lot of other things now all in the promotion of science and she's uh, very good and uh, sometimes controversial which is not a bad thing we have a panel about medicine uh, headed by dr brad mckay brad is a gp uh, he was on embarrassing bodies down under and he's also a member of the australian skeptics committee dr sue knight the uh, philosopher who is uh, the author of the current curriculum of the ethics program in New South Wales, which is, of course, the placement, we might call it, for the uh, religious education that's still 
available to students in New South Wales schools. The interesting thing about this program, the ethics program, is that it teaches children to ask questions and to form views in an informed manner. So it is not about any specific opinions. It is about how you think. And that is particularly important to skeptics because that is exactly what we try to do. We try to make society think better. We don't try to tell society what to think. Now, tell me about the conference itself. So it's uh, two days of speakers and socializing and, and a lot of fun. It is on the 13th and 14th of October in Chatswood in uh, New South Wales in Sydney. We have a venue called the Concourse. Not only is the venue itself really fantastic, but it, there's a lot of places to eat around and, and have fun. There's hotels. It's only $280 for the two days and the concession tickets as well. And it's amazing fun. I invite anybody who is interested in science or critical thinking or just knowledge in general to join us. I think they will have an amazing time. And how do they get tickets? Uh, they go to convention skeptics.com.au or to skepticon.com.au. That's Aran Segev, President of Australian Skeptics. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 